Good morning. I would like to welcome everyone to the New Discovery online service. Uh, I feel really blessed to be able to have this uh, technology, to be able to utilize it and be able to bring you God's word from, uh, from this side of the camera to the other side of your screen. Uh, I'm going to interrupt our series this morning from the book of Hebrews. It just didn't feel like this was a, a good time to continue on. In that particular passage, I felt like God wanted me to address this current um, corona crisis. And that's what I want us to do this morning. I want us to answer the question, how does God want us to conduct ourselves? How does God want us to respond during this current uh, crisis that's not only affected our nation, but the entire world? How does God want us to respond? Our text this morning is going to come from Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. This is a very familiar passage for many of you. It's the, it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And keep in mind a, a parable, a good definition for a parable is that it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And the word parable itself means to cast alongside. So what Jesus would do is he would take an abstract truth and place it alongside something common. So he would take a common story and use that common story to teach us uh, a spiritual truth. And that's what we see here in the parable of the Good Samaritan. So let's take a look at uh, Luke chapter 10. Interestingly, uh, Luke was a physician, so I could say we're going to be looking at what Dr. Luke has to say to us this morning about how we should conduct ourselves in this current crisis. Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Actually, I'll back up to verse 25, set the context. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So here in this particular parable, or leading up to the parable, I should say, we have an expert in the law. We could call him a lawyer. Uh, he knew the Old Testament law like the backside of his hand. And he comes to Jesus and asks him this very important question. And in response to this question about how to inherit eternal life, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your, your neighbor as yourself. Uh, he, he looks to be looking for a loophole in the second commandment. Imagine that, a lawyer looking for a loophole. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In other words, how restrictive can I apply this? Who do I not have to show love to? Who can I legally withhold my love from? That seems to be what he's after. So he's trying to understand this term neighbor in a very restrictive sense. And rather than just give the guy a simple answer, Jesus tells this parable that's come to be known as the Good Samaritan. Now in the, in the, in the 
parable, we see four main characters. So let's, let's briefly look at these characters and, and how they responded. First, we come to this unnamed man. We don't know anything about him. Seems to be implied that he, he's a, a Jewish man. He's been up to Jerusalem, or I should say down to Jerusalem. Now he's going back down an elevation to Jericho, about a 17-mile trip. And there's a lot of rocks and ravines and crevices, a lot of good places for robbers to hide. And while he's making his way back toward Jericho, he's waylaid by these robbers who probably emerged from behind the rocks or from maybe from behind some trees or bushes or whatever, totally catch the guy off guard. You might even say he got donkey jacked. They just take full advantage of this guy, rob him, beat him, strip him of his clothes, and the text says uh, leaves him on the side of the road for, you know, half dead. If you've ever been assaulted or robbed, you can maybe empathize with this poor fellow who's laying there bleeding and half dead. The next character we find in the text is the priest. He's traveling down the same road from Jerusalem as well. Now, what do you suppose the priest had been doing in Jerusalem? Keep in mind, Jerusalem is where the temple is located. What had that priest been doing in Jerusalem where the temple is located? Well, I think it's safe to assume he had been there doing what priests do. He had been there serving, serving there in the temple, serving those that had come to worship, maybe getting involved in the sacrifices, maybe lighting the incense, maybe lighting the lamps, who knows, maybe cleaning up a bit. He was there at the temple, most likely looking after the spiritual needs of the people that were coming there. And in that particular day and time, priests were looked upon as the most holy of people. And yet when he sees this, this man that's naked and bleeding on the side of the road, notice he's described again as half dead. So I get the idea that, you know, he's wiggling a little bit, a little bit of movement. The priest moves over to the other side of the road and passes the man by. He avoids this poor man that has been victimized. Okay, the next character we see in the parable is the, the Levite. You may wonder, well, who is a Levite? Well, a Levite, you might say he's kind of like an assistant to the priest. And the priest would come from the, the tribe of Levi. And, you know, who, who knows what he's been doing in Jerusalem, but most likely he's been doing something religious as well. And you might expect him to go over and help the poor man that's bleeding on the side of the road, but uh, he doesn't do so. He does just what the priest has done. He sees the man and he goes by on the other side of the road. Now, isn't it interesting? The two religious dudes did not stop and help this poor guy out. Two men that would have been very familiar with the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. You kind of get the feeling that they were acting like they didn't see the guy. But why? Why did they just pass right on by? Could it be that they didn't want to be bothered? Could it be that they didn't want to go to the trouble to maybe help someone else out? Could it be that they were just uh, too busy? Could it be that they just didn't want to be interrupted? I think it's safe to say maybe they were just so wrapped up in themselves for whatever reason that they did not want to extend love to this poor victim who's on the side of the road. Well, the next character we come to is the Samaritan, of course. Uh, Jesus' original audience probably cringed when he said Samaritan because the Jews and the Samaritans at that time uh, did not get along very well at all. I'm sure the, the lawyer uh, was shocked as well. Uh, when Jesus mentioned a Samaritan came along because Samaritans, they, they were despised. They were looked down upon by the Jews. Uh, they were uh, mixed ethnically. Uh, they believed a little different when it came to God. Uh, they, they, they weren't on the same page, you might say, exactly theologically. They didn't want to have anything to do with each other. Uh, Jews sort of looked at Samaritans as a, as a spiritual contaminant. They didn't want to touch them. They didn't want to use the same dishes they used. They didn't want to drink after them. It was so bad that they didn't even want to go through the land where they lived. They'd go around it. And if they did have to go through, they were sure to shake the dust off their feet. 
This was political incorrectness on steroids. Well, needless to say, the Samaritans and Jews didn't get along at well at all. That had been the case for hundreds of years. So when Jesus brings up a Samaritan, again, they would have been shocked. And in the parable, it's the Samaritan. He's really the hero of the story. He's the one we should emulate. He doesn't pass by on the other side of the road. It says when he sees the man, he has pity on him. That's important. In fact, that same word can be translated as compassion. He's moved with compassion. He goes over to the man. He bandages his wounds. He puts on the, the olive oil, which would have been the medicine of the day. He puts the man on his donkey vehicle of the day. And he took him to a motel. They didn't have hospitals during that time. So he took him to a place where he could recover. You might say it's like going to the hospital. And he even paid for the man's extended stay there if there needed to be such a long stay. Told the guy, if he stays even longer than that, I'll reimburse you. So that's how the Samaritan responded to this man that had been beaten laying on the side of the road, who most likely was Jewish. And Jesus concludes this parable with a very penetrating question. Which of these three men do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? In the Jewish law, your answer is probably with a big lump in his throat. He says, the man who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Of course, there's several lessons here we can learn. One pertains to the concept of, of neighbor. Our neighbor is not to be confined to someone who lives next door to us. Our neighbor is not to be confined to maybe someone who lives across the street from us or someone who even lives in our neighborhood. Our neighbor's not to be confined to uh, people who are like us, our same ethnicity. Our neighbor's not to be confined to people who are in our same religious affiliation. Really, our neighbor can be anyone who's around us at any given time. Jesus makes this plain to the loophole-looking lawyer. He was trying to understand neighbor in a restrictive sense, and Jesus was expanding it to say, really, it's anyone who is around you. Specifically, anyone around you who is in need. It could be people at work, uh, people at school, people on the way to work, people on the way to school, people, again, in your neighborhood, people in, in your home, anyone around you at any time. There's really no, no boundaries. So when, when a neighbor is in need, ideally, we're supposed to respond in love. Again, the Samaritan is the one we are to emulate. And I want to circle back to this, this idea of, of uh, compassion or mercy. That's important. I really believe that's what motivated him to obey the second commandment. And I believe that's what can help motivate us to obey the second commandment. This idea of mercy toward others, this idea of compassion toward others, we're really talking about empathy here. The ability to put ourselves in the place of somebody else. You see, that Samaritan was able to empathize with this guy lying on the side of the road. He thought, you know, that, that could have been me. That could be me laying there. I could have been the one that had been robbed and, and stripped and, and just lying there at, 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 the, at the mercy of, of nature, really. This guy was about to die. He's thinking, that, that could be me. So he was motivated and he empathized with this guy and it motivated him to do something. It motivated him to obey the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. You see, you, you have to be able to put yourself in the shoes of someone else to really be motivated to obey this passage. So let's apply that to the current corona crisis, if I can call it that, that's going on today. Main reason we're not having a normal church service this morning is because we want to we don't want to endanger other people. I don't think I have the coronavirus, but I don't know that for sure. Just as you, many of you watching, probably don't know if you if you have it or not. 
I don't think there's enough tests available yet. And so if we had a church service like normal and everyone came and filled this room, I could potentially endanger you. Now you might be one of those people that it wouldn't hurt at all and you could just shuck it right off, no problem. But you might be one of those that get it and you develop pneumonia and your lungs fill up and you might get really sick or pass away. So I'm trying to obey the second greatest commandment to love you as I have to love myself. And that's why we're practicing some social distancing here at New Discovery Christian Church. I know some, some may wish we could have met together. I wish we could have met together as well. Uh, but this is the next best thing and we're doing it because we're obeying the second greatest commandment to love others as we love ourselves. So we're practicing social distancing and I, I want to challenge you to, to continue to practice that. They say, you know, try not to get within six feet of, of other people. Uh, that's a good way to, to ensure that not only you may not get it, but you may not give it to somebody else. You know, I've been seeing these, these clips on TV of those on spring break and they're, they're going to the beach and they're having a good time and they're just partying it up. They're, they're really acting selfishly because they could catch the virus themselves and bring it back home to their parents or their grandparents and cause them to get really, really sick. They're really not practicing the second greatest commandment because if they really loved others, they would not be conducting themselves in, a, in such a manner that would endanger somebody else. See, that's not really showing love. Love is empathizing with somebody else and doing all you can to help somebody else, not hurt somebody else. Along these same lines, it, it's, it's trouble to me to see the hoarding that's going on. You know, in the Sam's and Costco and Walmart and, and Kroger, you know, people, of course, buying up all the toilet paper. That's not that big a deal. We can live without toilet paper. I don't want to, but we, we can live without toilet paper. But what about, what about food and, and other necessities? Uh, people grabbing up all the food. Um, I don't think that's practicing the second greatest commandment. Because see, if you, if you love other people like you should and you want the best for them, and you're putting yourself in their place, you're not going to be getting more than you need. See, because when we hoard, we're taking food away from other people that need it. Or, or the disinfectant wipes. People may need disinfectant wipes, but if you hoard them all up yourself then somebody else can't have them. And that could really go for any kind of necessity or anything that's needed. We need to make sure that we're not just thinking about ourselves, but we're thinking about other people and we're empathizing with them and putting ourselves in their shoes. Let me share a passage with you from Matthew uh, chapter 6, especially along these lines when it comes to, you know, hoarding. According food, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25, Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself each day has enough trouble of its own God does not want his people worrying about food what we're going to eat what we're going to drink so when we go to the grocery store we need to get just enough for us, in faith, believing that God's going to take care of us. If we go into hoarding, whatever it might be, we're really showing a lack of trust toward God and a lack of love toward others, which I think is most serious. Notice he said, it's the pagans that run after all these things. 
It's the pagans who are overly concerned about what they're going to eat and what they're going to drink. And God does not want us to act like pagans. And by the way, a pagan is somebody that doesn't believe in the one true God. If we believe in God, the idea here is we're going to trust God. Notice what he says. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, what are the things? The necessities of life will be given to you as well. Now this is important. He says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, we can't really claim this promise unless we're seeking God first. Putting God and his program first on our priority list. And his righteousness. In other words, conforming our lives to God's standards. So if we're putting his kingdom first, that's going to be reflected in our church participation, in our church service, our good deeds toward other people. It's going to be reflected in our in our morality, our life's going to be characterized by righteous behavior, kind of conduct that God expects of us. And as we're putting God first and we're living for God morally, we do not need to worry about tomorrow. Whether it be food or the coronavirus, God is going to take care of His people who put His program first and are living for Him. So keep that in mind as we get further and further into this, this uh, pandemic that's really going all around the world, put God first. Put His conduct first. And treat other people like you would like to be treated. You know, I always heard it put this way, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's how God wants us to respond in this current corona crisis. Good morning, everyone. I know this is uh, a little bit different of a service than what we usually do uh, here on this Sunday and just because of everything that's going on. But in this time, we're going to go, uh, in a second, we're going to go into our, our time of communion. And some of the things, even though we're not meeting together in this time and uh, we're not around uh, a lot of people in this time, some of us are, you know, in our own homes and, you know, we could be very isolated from other people. But in this time right now, uh, as we have, even if it's people just inside your home, we're going to come around the table. There may not be a physical table, but we're going to come around the table of communion and whoever you're with right now in, in your household. Uh, and if there is no one around you right now, uh, know that we're one in spirit as well in this time of going into communion, may we not forget in this time what Jesus has done uh, and what we're remembering, that Jesus sacrificed his own life uh, to love us, that Jesus did this for other people. Uh, and as the scriptures say, he did this, he sacrificed for the joy set before him, which is all of us together and in a form of love. And May we remember that so that we may do the same in our lives right now. Uh, even though we may not be around people, may we still continue to focus on loving each other. And when we're taking the bread, which is Jesus' body, when we're taking the, the juice, uh, Jesus' blood, uh, may we remember what he has done for us and that we also embody that life into the rest of our weeks as well. And may we think in this time of fear and this time of anxiety, as we know Jesus did when he was in the garden, he was sweating blood. So, you know, he was fearful and anxious over what he did and in this time of fear. May we also think how we can serve others, how we can love others and, and to think um, outside of ourselves in this time, even though that could be very hard as we see other people uh, hoarding, hoarding, hoarding things up and, Maybe they're not putting their minds on other people. Um, uh, and just, just may we remember that in this time, this time of fear. Uh, so we're about to go into our time of communion and we're going to take it together. Uh, so go ahead and pray with me. Father God, we come before you today just very thankful, just very grateful uh, in your presence. Uh, thank you for Jesus and all that he's done in our lives um, as we are about to take this cup and about to take um, uh, 
the, the bread God and just remember who he is and no matter what is happening right now, um, that still stands. That still stands with what he did to have a relationship with you right now and also forever. And help us to remember that in this time, uh, in this time of fear, the hope and the joy and the love that he gave and poured out towards other people and that we may embody that as well. And it's all in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Since this is our online service today, we're trying to stick very close to what we do on Sunday. And this, this right now is going to be our time of, of offering right now. And it's going to look a little bit different because we're not meeting in person. And, you know, if you have checks or you have cash, um, you know, we, we don't have the plate today. So you're not going to see me passing the plate with you today or Jabin or Mr. Larry. Uh, so I want to remind you guys in this moment as we're, we're designated time of offering that we have the church app, uh, New Discovery Church app. And if you don't have it downloaded, this is a time to download if you, if you like. And there's a spot in, in there for offerings and you click it and it'll take you to where you need to go and you can designate your amount of, for offering. And also, and say you don't want to do it that route or you don't have a smartphone, you can also go to our website and there's a spot on there for offerings as well. And there's also, it'll have a number for you on, on the website to text it in. So if you want to text it in your offering, that's another option that you can do on the website on the offering section on there. I'll also just add a, a a reminder that even though we're not meeting together right now and the whole congregation on Sundays and also on Wednesdays, we just want you guys to keep in mind uh, together that the expenses of the building and our monthly expenses, uh, they don't change uh, even though we're not meeting together. So the bills are still going to be there and everything that we need to do also for ministry and, and getting ready for ministry as we get past this coronavirus and we also move forward.